Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vanderark from Getting Smart, here uh, to talk about new pathways, uh, new pathways through high school, uh, to and through post-secondary and into high wage employment. Uh, we're gonna focus part of our conversation today on the, the new um, architecture for high school, how people are organizing high schools uh, in ways that make sense for kids that create um, coherence and acceleration and uh, support and mostly personalization where students um, feel like everything that they do fits together for them and is purposeful and is headed in a direction that's important to them. Um, historically, people have been doing that using things like career academies. That often requires a blunt choice in eighth grade when you're not quite sure who you are, much less what you want to do. Uh, for a living, and so we're seeing a lot of interesting work happening with high schools that um, are uh, trying to do career academies, but leaving lots of room for, uh, for personalization. Um, we're going to try to incorporate some, uh, we'll go a little bit off script and try to incorporate a little, as much uh, audience participation as we can today. Um, we'll invite you to um, make quick comments. We are filming today for a live and recorded audience, so keep your comments uh, concise, particularly if you're like off screen. No uh, cussing. And <laughs> Don't cuss. We have, we have three of my Thanks, favorite- Thanks, Mom. Hu we have three of my favorite humanoids uh, joining us today. Um, Mary Ryersey, who is uh, Managing Director at XQ. XQ is, uh, as many of you know, is um, been around for a decade, um, launching some of the most innovative high schools in America. Uh, Corey Moan. Corey is the uh, ED at CAPS, Blue Valley CAPS, um, which is the coolest career accelerator in America for high school students. Um, and now it's a very cool national network with uh, 75 locations, 76 locations, including one in internationally and uh, about 100. 40 participating school districts. Uh, I got the chance to visit on Friday and it's as cool as ever. And Byron Sanders, uh, Big Thought, Dallas, uh, the coolest after school, out of school, summer learning program in America. Um, and Byron and his team have had the, the opportunity, hasn't always felt that way, but the uh, recent opportunity to develop a very cool high school with Fort Worth ISD around their creator um, archetype. So we're super excited about them. Um, I'm gonna give them one shot, but then would, would love uh, to call out some of the cool pathway models that are uh, here in the room, just so you, uh, one, we all get a chance to learn about the cool things that are happening in America, and, and then I'll use those as a cue for uh, our panel to, uh, to, to pivot off of some of the examples from the audience, so welcome guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mary, XQ, well it launched as a big prize competition, which is really cool. You were one of the original judges. Yes. Um, maybe the coolest thing about that was that it, it resulted in thousands of teams, huh? Thousands, you know, yep, 9,000. Maybe 10,000, yep. 10, 10, yep. 9,000 teams uh, using the guide and, and studying the future of American high school. and and then it resulted in a handful of uh, grants. Um, yeah, correct. How, so how do you think about that process broadly and then the grantee schools, what, what do they represent? What are some of the themes that for you point to the new architecture of American high schools? Awesome, thanks for asking Tom and great to see everyone here and uh, appreciate being here with the two of you as well. And. So broadly, XQ, as, as you shared, we're all about rethinking high school and knowing that it's time to have a, um, an, an experience that engages young people in a meaningful way, if taking with the focus on equity and innovation. And it did all start with the competition, and we are, and that yielded uh, a network of schools that were rethinking high school. We've now expanded to be working with the State Department of Education in Rhode Island, New York City Public Schools, DC. Some of the school examples that I'll share are from schools that emerged from that competition. So one, one theme I would start with, and um, a quick shout out, because you said that we'd also pay attention to what people in the room were doing. Um, we actually have some people here from Purdue Polytechnic High School. And so quick shout out to Scott Bass and Kiana Warren and Chatoya Ward. Um, executive director and principals, respectively, 
effectively. And I would talk about Purdue Polytechnic, whether they were in the room or not. We just, we just hung out with them like Friday, Thursday. Yep, yep, yes. just uh, last week at the Carnegie why, Summit. Why do you think Purdue's so important? So, and you and I visited there uh, almost five years ago, shortly after they emerged from the competition. I, I, I think what Purdue represents so much is the architecture of designing with what we really want from the beginning. Yeah. So it grew out of one of XQ's design principles for you know, some of the key things that we think are, are key to the architecture. And one of them is deep community engagement. And so community members and education leaders, including um, Mitch Daniels, the Purdue University president, had seen this disturbing data around the disproportionately small number of students from underrepresented populations, particularly in Indianapolis, attending Purdue University and becoming boilermakers, as they call them in West Lafayette. Uh, so they want this school w was intended specifically to give access, to provide access and opportunity not only to be engaged in high school, but also to have real experience with industry and, career, and um, higher ed. So one way that Purdue has done that is, is through their industry partnerships. So these are deep, meaningful partnerships. I talked to Kiana last week and Shatoya frequently. Like some principals, they're like, okay, they're engaging with students and parents. You expect that on a weekly basis with district leaders. These two are actively um, interacting with their industry partners and higher ed partners. Right just as any other part of the community. So one quick example, industry challenges. Um, how do you feed nine billion people by the year 2050? So for challenges like that, the school meaningful, and you love the concept of sprints. I think it's because you're a fast runner, but like project sprints. So they do um, project sprints. 50 years ago. Okay, well, faster than I was when I ran with you last time. So. Uh, Anyway, the, these project sprints are going after big questions that integrate the cognitive skills, the academic skills, and the career skills. And it's not like they just go on a field trip and go to a, one of the big industry partners. They partner in meaningful ways with, like, Corteva, formerly um, uh, Dow, uh, so Corteva and Lilly, and they have these meaningful partnerships where students are engaging with the professionals all the way through. Me, also at Purdue University, it's not just that they have... Um, real currency, the transcripts that these young people leave high school with, um, if, if so long as they meet certain criteria, actually get them into Purdue, and it's coming with credits, dual credits, and with some social capital. So it's a, the, par the industry so partnership is deep. Let me, let me interrupt here. Uh, so what I love about what you just said um, is that most high schools are sort of trapped in, in this schedule where kids go course to course, right? At Purdue, the architecture is really around these client-connected projects. So they're, they're often big blocks, and they're complemented by, I call them individual skill sprints, right? right. But, but it's where student is doing mostly asynchronous, mostly competency-based at their own pace. And so you have this interesting combination of project-based learning and asynchronous personalized learning. And so those, those are the foreground, and courses have sort of been pushed into the background. and Every adult and every student really has a unique schedule every week. Absolutely. So that's a, that's a, cha a logistical challenge, right. but it's personalized right. and it's meaningful and they're doing real work. Who else? I'll share a couple, one other one that, or I'll share just a quick lightning round because I know we want to hear from Corey and Byron. So uh, the other thing, I'm holding this stack of cards. You talked about these at Carnegie, but at, at XQ, one of the things we talk about is this learner framework and whether you call it 21st century skills, Tom, we've called it broader aims, but how do we have young people um, how do we have young people have m meaningful learning experiences that actually are authentic ways to experience not just I'm literate or I have knowledge, but I'm applying these skills as a courageous problem solver, an innovative thinker, as a collaborative, a generous collaborator. And so at schools like Brooklyn, like we're working with New York City, at schools like Brooklyn Steam, they've got this deep connection where students are choosing majors and industry partners, and if it's film and industry, it's not like... Um, just like I said at Purdue, it's not like your old-fashioned field trip. Here, it's not like they're just learning how to operate a camera. They're actually doing screenwriting and production and storyboarding. At Latitude in Oakland, uh, just met with, I was there just a couple of weeks, a shout out to Oakland, and the Latitude was just there uh, a few weeks ago, and I went into a computer science class. And so these, these, this example, these couple examples are representative of this learner framework where we don't learn knowledge here and then apply it there, or learn knowledge just to get ready yeah. to apply it later in life. This is where students are already contributing to their industry partners. So let me, let me do another underline. So okay. all of the schools that you've talked about 
have a common set of learning goals, really inspired by the XQ learner goals, yeah. as um, articulated in this cool little deck of cards. I've got a few if somebody and wants And so those, those learning goals are really front and center, and there's opportunities to develop competencies across that outcome framework all day, every day, in and out of school. So that's another difference, right? For sure. You just don't do English and English and then do problem solving and math. You're doing problem solving across the curriculum. You're doing critical thinking across the curriculum. And so everybody has an opportunity to contribute to the outcome framework. Absolutely. And just I'll just share one more example and then um, want to pass the, pass the mic along. But at Latitude, I, when I walked in um, to this computer science class, yes, they were learning about Boolean, you know, the, the logic algorithm and everything else. But this young woman came up to me and she said, hi, my name's Janelle. I'm the chief creative officer for our math app. And she was, that was how she introduced herself. Like, I don't know about you, but when, if I'm going to go with this contrast again, when I was doing cooperative learning school or circles as a teacher and as a kid, there were like boring rules like timekeeper yeah. or note taker. Maybe that was just what I got. <laughs> but like here, she's introducing herself. Like I'm the chief creative officer. And so she was going to go do empathy interviews with these math students, with these fifth grade math learners at a nearby elementary school. And then she was going to use that empathy, those empathy interviews to create a mood board, mood board and then code the app. So she's embodying, like this is part of the, the differences. My, my point there is like, this is agentic behavior. Like she was acting in that role, not just thinking she had to wait someday for that role. Yeah, That's what I get and excited I, about with these all I've, coming together. I've come to believe that student agency is probably the most important outcome. Mm -hmm. And you see that at uh, front and center at every one of the XQ schools. Another one of the best national examples of school focused on a very cool outcome framework is One Stone. Michelle's here from there, onestone.org. Check out their mastery um, transcript. It's very cool. It's used as a learning record from the day students walk in till the day they leave. They can visually see and demonstrate to their community the uh, progress on their 32 competencies. Another thing that you talked about at Purdue was the opportunity to experience success in college while you're in high school and to gain college credit opportunities. So another example of that is ASU Prep. Uh, we'll be doing a session together with ASU this afternoon, but Arizona State has sponsored a network of um, 12 schools across the valley where all learners have the opportunity to earn college credit while they're in high school. What's really cool is that it's R1 credit, right? It's not, it's not just a community college uh, credit, which is great. It's, uh, it's ASU credit. They, uh, Betsy and team also run um, ASU Prep Digital which is statewide and nationwide, and kids have uh, in digital also have an opportunity to earn um, college credit opportunities. Could I brag about the results that yeah. Purdue got, like yeah. with their first graduating class? There are 37 college freshmen at Purdue University that came from the inaugural graduating class of Purdue Polytechnic High School who are now currently enrolled. And just to put that in context, they set out, don't forget to, to change the dynamics of who is enrolling and having opportunities. Previously, historically, all of Indianapolis public schools, you would send the, in the number of single digit students of color to Purdue each year. Like you could count them on one or two hands. This school and of these 37 kids who enrolled, over half of them are students of color. So this school in one swoop, one graduating class more than tripled um, that matriculation and is making an impact and in, to getting to STEM careers writ large as well. So Super that's cool. pretty impressive with your first class. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, another cool XQ school is Crosstown High, crosstownhigh.org in Memphis. It's in this vertical urban village, former um, Sears Distribution Center, coolest um, urban redevelopment project in America, I think. Um, and, and another great example of a school combining sort of skill sprints and projects around an outcome framework. For sure. And, and some young people were talking um, about their projects last week, and they're, one of them right now is, where do you see inequities in Memphis? And so these students are doing real projects that they care about with their partners, both within concourse, within the Crosstown concourse and beyond. And they're going along on competencies and making sure that students are integrating those skills. So we, it's amazing to see what, what these young people are doing. On, when, when did I come and visit, Wednesday? Wednesday. Wednesday. Time flies when you're having yes. fun. <laughs> so on Wednesday morning at like 8.05, I walked into CAPS, Center for Advanced Professional Studies in in Blue Valley, it's just southeast of Kansas City. And um, I walked into an emergency room and there were young people 
Um, responding to an emergency, teacher behind the screen acting as the patient, it was hilarious. Uh, so kids running an emergency room. The next room I walk into, um, three young men are building an airplane in the frickin' lobby of, <laughs> of CAFs. And then I walked into a lounge, very groovy lounge, and there were four young men who unprompted, unscripted, told me about the business that they were starting. One was a crazy amazing um, software uh, to enhance gaming on multiple platforms. He showed me the demo he'd built. This is a kid that had never been in coding and learned coding real time while building a business. I met a kid who'd built an automotive camera to promote safety. I met a young person doing Angie for teens to promote um, teen working. And I met, what was it, there was the other one, it was really cool. This is in like the first 15 minutes. So kids doing extraordinary professional level community connected work. And it was at CAPS and Corey's been the ED there for six years? Seven years now, which is crazy. It's, Time flies. And, and like I said at the outset, now you've launched this amazing network of partners all over the country around this idea of professions-based learning. What, unpack that, what, what is it? And, and, you know, the theme of this session is pathways. So how, is it really just a set of random courses or do you think it sort of adds up to spurs, creates a pathway? Uh, what is it and how do you think about it relating to pathways? Yeah, well, the first thing I would say is the reason that we've been able to grow a network around this is because of amazing people out in the field that we empower to do this work. And we've got a number of them in the audience. We've got four states of CAPS represented here, Minnesota, Missouri, Arkansas, uh, Kansas that are here. We've got some others waving the way. CAPS, yeah. CAPS family here. You guys are awesome. And, uh, Good to see you again. Yeah. And so, you know, and something, Tom, that you've said before, and I really, it's stuck with me, is this idea that there's, there's, there are things that kind of organize that are... Um, kind of like hierarchical networks of sorts or organizations or associations. But then there's this thing called a generative network where people out in the field are empowered to feed back where, where you're creating energy beyond just the headquarters, right? The, n the nodes of innovation. I'm taking credit for that idea. You should. It's on, it's on, the, it's on the podcast, so you get credit. Right. Yeah, you, you said it. But, uh, but yeah, so um, you know, we started with a program in a public school district a lot of interest in it. I think the, the thing that gets people so excited, and Tom does a great job of explaining kind of what happened last week, and that's something that happens when people come see it, is that students are fast forwarded past high school and college. We're putting them into their first career opportunity, and they get to try it out and rule it out. And the difference between what, how we typically think of pathways is we very much believe in the idea of the pivot. So for students to have a true self-discovery process, to try some things, to be not uh, fearful of making a change, but actually kind of rewarded for making a change because we celebrate that they ruled something out that gives them a better chance of really honing in on what it is that truly is behind them, right? What is their purpose? That's so important. When you are aligned to purpose as a human being, you do amazing things, right? And you don't even see what you're doing as work. You want to do it. And that's what we want from our kids. And so giving this explorative process, fast forwarding the kids, giving them a chance to try things, it's empowering and it gives them a chance to, uh, to really step into what they wanna do and build confidence. That's our key metric is, is how confident are you around what we would call professional skills. That's really important and it, it makes a difference. Do most CAPS learners um, ex experience that for half a day? For a year or two? Most of our programs, so when we partner with school districts, we meet local conditions. So we're very flexible in how it plays out. But I would say most of our programs are half a day. Some are every day, some are every other day, depending on the school schedule and what works for the school. But the ability to block a little bit of time together, whether it's two blocks or, th or two periods or three periods, gives the students a chance to truly dive into authentic projects. Yeah. One of the lines that has become kind of famous around our network is this idea of the 10th thing on the to-do list, right? Everyone has a 10th thing on their to-do list. You never get to it. Why not hand it off to high school kids and let them take a hack at it and deliver back some value to you? And that, time and time again, uh, creates valuable partnerships. The, 
I guess the thing that I most appreciate about all the CAPS affiliates is that it creates this safe space to audition possible futures, right? Where kids can really go in depth with something and go, I love that, or that really sucked. I don't want to do that for the rest of my life. Um, and safe so- place to audition, can I steal that one too? Yeah. That's a good one, I like that. I, I almost wish we had a mini CAPS in eighth grade um, that would help kids make better, uh, better high school choices. Um, Stephanie runs this really cool program called GPS Education. Um, we've known GPS for 10 years, and they, they started out by running um, these manufacturing embedded experiences, working with uh, 20 or 30 school districts and 200 business partners, and students would spend half day, they'd, go to, they'd take sort of a blended personalized morning and then half day in the afternoon um, in, a, in a manufacturing site. So it's kind of a combination of an internship, they'd often earn college credit because they'd cycle through a local community college, they'd leave with industry credentials, you'd get a couple different work experiences, right? So that it's a CAPS-like opportunity to go really deep and leave high school with skills, college credit, credentials, and usually job offers. We, we may actually be partnering soon yeah. in a district, so you're, you're spot on again, my friend. That, so that's gonna be an interesting experiment. Yeah. Now, a lot of the work Mary's doing is, the work we're doing is with schools that Mary hasn't gotten to yet that need that Bring connection, em. right? Yeah. They need You're right, there's a big tent. There's a big need, there's a big tent, lots of room. There's, there's a case study on GPS on our site. J just figure out where it is and tell people. <laughs> Nate, um, Nate, Nate, Nate worked with Stephanie on a case study and it's worth checking out. Um, it's a good thing you have Jessica. Jenny, can you hang out for a minute? Yeah. I wanna come back to you in just a minute. But um, Brother Byron, what, what's up with Big Thought? Oh, nothing. <laughs> um, so. Do, do, quick do the, the, over, the after school over and then, and then let's absolutely. do the creator. But you, you guys do. Yeah, so we, we started 30, over 30 years ago, uh, an organization in Dallas. Matter of fact, we used to be an affiliate of Young Audiences, which is a big arts into the school system. Yeah. Over the years, we kept building different skill sets. It went from arts exclusively to after school systems, summer systems, SEL systems. So now, in a non COVID year, total touch points about 150,000 kids in the wow. Dallas area between our own programs and working with our partners. Yeah. Um, and, and really, all of the connective thread between all of those phases is we are about building creators. Right, every young person has a creative and a creating capacity inside of them. We it's up to us to create the conditions and experiences that allow that to come out. Um, shout out to my team, who's here: Aaron Offord, Chief of Programs and Systems; Greg McPherson, Chief of Big Thought Institute, which is kind of our research evaluation and our consulting practice as well. And so, all of that come together, we decided to move forward with a. A uh, crazy idea of getting outside of what we had become, quite frankly, experts in, which is things that are taking place in out of school time, non traditional learning spaces, because it's inspirational of everything that you all have been saying here. We have been really good about creating experiences centered on youth agency outside of the traditional learning space, right? It's one of the easier places to do it because, again, you know, it was the wild, wild west for a long time, right? But we did a lot of work in bringing structure and, and talking about what quality looks like, building community, working with partners, things like that. Byron, it, some of your programs, whether they're spoken word or the arts, are about helping kids tell their story. Yes, right? yes. Speaking uh, with, with voice and choice. That's right. Right, and developing a sense of agency. So let me read a, a quote from the school that we started this year uh, we call it our zero year because anything happening during COVID, you're gonna go ahead and say that's, uh, we're gonna put an asterisk right next to that. Um, but actually some pretty beautiful things have come from it. This quote, no matter the hardships you grow up with, you will be labeled. You go through so much. Your parents and these labels 
don't describe you. You are not your parents. You are not a loser. You are a chooser. Because you decide what you want, you decide what you want. I learned so much here and I feel like I can make better decisions now. I'm going to concentrate on me. Now, that quote is so powerful because what we haven't talked about yet is the school that we are, that we are in partnership with Fort Worth Independent School uh, District on is an alternative school. The youth who are coming to us are referred to us from disciplinary referrals, which means these are some of the young people who fit less, less well, least well, in systems that we currently have. And we decided intentionally to do this with an independent school district because our theory is if we can build a youth-centered, youth agency at the center of it, creative, restorative model that works well for these young people who have not had a good experience in school for whatever reason, then there's a strong case to be made that high school itself should evolve in order to embrace these same concepts. Um, the theory is coming from something that we have been doing for about 30 years, which is a program called Creative Solutions. We actually do it with the Juvenile Justice Department in Dallas County. It has the lowest recidivism rate of any program serving young people in that space. A good program gets you about 30, 40% recidivism rate. Our seven-year average is just over 10%. Uh, we just got longitudinal data showing that we're at 5% with an even longer arc. The thought is we all have creative energy. And oftentimes, the results that we're getting from young people is not because they don't have the capacity to excel, to do well. It's because they're not locked in for whatever reason. It could be the trauma that they're coming from. It could be they're absolutely bored and everything in between. But if we build a model that centers them and creates real life pathways to do real life things that actually matter, not from my good 13 years from now, but today, then you can do something special. And we're on that journey. We're starting to get more and more stories like this uh, coming out of that model. I, I was meaning to send you an email the other day that I think, and I'll just tell you now. I'm about to say you can do it now. And yeah. um, I think we should build a national network of schools focused on your creator, creative archetype, yeah. plus Web3, plus entrepreneurship where kids are finding new ways to express themselves and learning new business models simultaneously. Tom, that's a brilliant idea. I think that you have a lot of um, and Corey can credibility help us scare, here. You can help us scale like part-time versions of it. Like together we could do this and Mary could be the grant maker. This is a brilliant idea. It's amazing <laughs> what just happened. Well, uh, let, me, let me tell um, the, the team what the creator archetype is, because I haven't gone into that. Creator archetype is the notion that we, we just essentially gave framework and nomenclature to a 21st century learner. And what we said is that that person is a creator because, as you all know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, 80% of the jobs that will be available for today's third grader don't exist yet. So if you try and get too discreet with your pathways, especially early on, then you know, you're know you keying somebody up to go into typewriting when the iPhone comes out, right? So what we said is there are core traits, characteristics, and spaces that create a young person who can step into the big, uh, great tomorrow, no matter what it is, and live on the frontiers of possibility. Five different domains. The biggest one is social and emotional learning. Social emotional development is an anchor for everything else that you build on. The second is academics and artistry. That's what happens in your traditional eight to three block. The third is digital fluency in all of its iterations, including digital wisdom, like making the right choices, understanding data literacy. The fourth, design thinking, higher order thinking, right? Analytics, human-centered design as far as a discrete skill. And the last one is civics and service because it's understanding that no matter what you do, your choices have an impact on somebody else. Yeah. And it's understanding that building that into a learning framework is actually critical for us to have a better world, more just and verdant society. I love that. Hey, Fernando, what, what would a network of schools focused on citizenship, what, what might that look like? What might some of the experiences look like?
brings to mind the the link between creativity and citizenship. I think it's, a, it's it, there's not that big a difference. Um, right. If you imagine the kind of projects that we've been doing in Kansas City with young people that are engaging in creating art as a project for a client, as an act also of citizenship. So for example, with the Truman Presidential Library, they were given the task at the reopening to create artworks that expressed what that part of history meant to them. And the kids were like, what are you talking about? We're like, make art that talks about what this narrative of America means to you. And the artworks that came out of this were incredible with kids saying, well, they left out the story of LGBTQ. They left out the story of whatever, the Vietnamese refugees, but this is my version of that story. And the kids were presenting it to the directors of the museums, shaking, right? This was their moment of agency, right? This was their moment of being there. And the questions we asked at the end were, um, around, you know, did the, what did this do for you? Like, what was the impact on you? It was all around belonging, being seen, being heard, all this stuff you're talking about, to be able to have a voice in your community as a creator. I think it's very close, it's this blend, that blend of networks you're talking about, that is civics, right? Yeah. I don't think civics is the three branches of government or whatever, it's, it's being an agent who's seen and is, has belonging and feels an identity that is in correspondence sure. with others. Both of you have talked about a frame, but one that kids can completely individualize, right? Right. And lean into, so I love that. If you wanna know what's happening in Ukraine, listen to my podcast with Fernanda last Wednesday. She's a Russia scholar, and she brilliantly weaves 500 years of history into what's happening over there, and then does 10 more minutes on how we should be teaching civics and history as a result. So thank you for that. Um, another network that we should start is one focused on sustainability, health, and equity. Oh, yeah, Jenny, you already did. Um, Great idea, Tom. Jenny, Jenny, uh, Jenny, can... Jenny Seidel runs the Green Schools National Network. We, we love you. Green Schools, it, it's greenschoolsnationalnetwork.org. Yep, yep. Um, why do people join your network, and what, what do kids get as a result? Well, one of the things that I think is beautiful is um, Dallas-Fort Worth has been engaged with us at, op at times on the operations side. So has Blue Valley on the operations side. We've not yet... Oh, well, we, well need, we, we are eager to do some work in this space. <laughs> so when we think about healthy, equitable, sustainable schools, it's, it's about what teaching and learning is, but it's also the environment, the learning environment, everything, every decision that everybody in the district makes and how it influences the child to think about their role in creating the future, hence the co-creation of a sustainable future. And so I think that what is most exciting to hear is that every single one of your schools probably has some of, and every school in the country has a pathway in to what we call our green print. Um, we look at leadership, um, curriculum and instruction, culture and climate, and facilities and operations. And it is a designed and we work to support schools and school districts to create learning environments that are enhancing and supporting a vision of a sustainable future, equi equitable and sustainable future. So that's us. Healthy, equitable, sustainable. It's yeah. a beautiful framework. It's a green print. You can find it if you Googled green print. It would pop up. Check it out. Um, Mike. What the heck does a transcript and a learner record have to do with all this? I, I'd love to just explore. We, could we stay for another hour? We could. <laughs> you know we could do this. But like in two minutes, how we've talked about all these interesting learning experiences, how to, how to help learners tell their story and what, what yeah. does a record and a transcript have to do with it? Well, I would turn it around to the audience, right? So think of the energy you're all feeling hearing these stories of these school models, right? And if you're a parent or an educator, you want this for your kid, right? Interdisciplinary, project-based, experiential. So then you gotta ask yourself, why aren't we all doing this? And we think that one reason is college. College admissions people, they want our kids as scholars. They want them on their campuses doing these things. But when they look at them as applicants, they only know how to see them as GPAs and numbers of credit hours. They'll talk to a student from Byron School and say, <clears throat> How many credit hours did you get in social studies? What was your grade in English in the fall? So we have to come up with a model that meets these schools where they are. Um, that, and if we do that, then we uh, open the floodgates for innovation. 
Awesome. Thanks. Do you want to say anything about that? I know as XQ, uh, as an outcome framework and is, is thinking deeply about how to credential that framework, how to create a learner record. So th th that formula seems to make sense to you guys. It makes a ton of sense. And we think that's really the, the next um, frontier in how to make sure that this isn't just like extra after school time or what might be called a page two on a transcript, but actually yeah. how we do that. So I know some of you were there with XQ and Carnegie and others last week who made a commitment to let's figure out ways to give kid a, to award credits, credential, and yeah. validate and verify when students are bringing who they are what they can do, their passions and their contributions in yeah. high school. And, and Byron, so you're super interested in this because you, you want all that cool stuff you're doing out of school to count. You, you want them to be equipped to either use it to push in for credit or to at least be a credential that they can and an artifact that they can share. Right? Absolutely, and 100%. And, and what we're doing in the Dallas area is, you know, we have an existing large ecosystem of hundreds of different programmatic partners. And the idea is that with this creator archetype concept, we're now moving to have our partners map their programs to these particular skill sets, discrete 21st century skill sets that are going there. And our goal, especially with some of the work that we've done here recently, I could go for days on how much has been done. But the idea is that you have your transcript, of course, but recognize these credentialed, now commonly um, um, mapped, like with a significant and a commonly understood nomenclature, look at this whole portfolio of what a young person brings to the table, and that creates a more distinct picture for what they're capable of. And we're actually working on that exact system in Dallas with Dallas City of Learning. Awesome. Let's finish with two minute lightning round of cool pathway examples or models um, that illustrates something that we've talked about. One might be outlier. You guys are kind of next-gen college credit opportunities, right? It's online. What else makes it cool in 15 seconds? Sure. An outlier. <laughs> now, we do, uh, we do online college courses. We have outcomes of success for students that rival in-person learning, and that's never happened in the history of civilization. So that's what we do at outlier. Hey, that was 12 seconds. That was awesome. <laughs> What else? Who else wants to tell us about something they're cool they're doing? Two minutes and 25 seconds. Yeah, there we go. All right. Yeah. And we're partnering with ASU, hey Betsy, uh, and multiple universities across the country to provide high school students actual college courses. So one of our partners is Stanford. We work with Princeton. Yale and students get to take an actual course. Very cool. They're on, online? Online and in person, though. And with their high students school. take, is it concurrent enrollment? Yep. So they get high school credit and college credit. That's super cool. Um, ASU also offers um, these universal courses where you can take the course in high school and then at the end of the course decide if you want it to count for college credit. So I love that. Another okay. pathway. One in. A cool Back pathway corner. example. Yeah. Hi, Rhonda. I'm uh, Rhonda Dale. I'm the executive director of Next Level NOLA. We are running a 13th year program in New Orleans serving New Orleans public school students who are finishing school without a credential and without a pathway for a debt-free college option. Awesome. So it is a hybrid college model um, and a career readiness model. That's really awesome. One more in the back. And then, Corey, I want you to mention a program or two in the network that you want to give a shout out to. Oh, well, am I going to preempt you here, Corey? Because yeah, I'm he part of the network. You, yeah. Go. I'm part of the network. So um, I'm one of the CAPS programs. We're, we're in Kansas City as well, but I serve a different population. In the, and there are many things that are unique about our program compared to Boo Valley. But I think one thing that's really cool that would, the crowd would be interested in hearing is that I don't have a building. My classes are hosted entirely inside of business partner sites. So if you're in my healthcare program, you're reporting to a room in a hospital where I'm staffing that with a certified instructor, with a certified teacher with the state. But you talk about a different experience for a kid to walk in and yeah. scrubs, name badge up here, because right. that's where they were at the hospital. It's a totally different feel. That's very cool. Thank you, Brett. 
All right, never mind. That was your that was your shout out. I'm, I'm we, glad he's the one that said. But so there's we, that identity again. Tom. It is. Like it's that it totally is. Field. It's it, experiencing success and what's next. That's yeah. what I that's what I love about so much of what we've talked about. Thanks for being at the uh, pathway session. Appreciate all of your examples. We'll stick around for a couple minutes, but thanks for coming. Thanks. Thank you.